now discuss mitral regurgitation, which is a frequent diagnosis in patients referred to the echo lab. Mitral regurgitation is multifactorial in etiology. These etiologies will be demonstrated in real time throughout the remaining part of this tape. The approach to patients with mitral regurgitation involves first establishing the diagnosis of mitral regurgitation, then determining the etiology, and finally assessing the hemodynamic severity. The hemodynamic severity is determined from measurement of the left ventricle and left atrium, from continuous wave Doppler via assessment of the signal strength and of the forward velocity, from pulsed wave Doppler mapping, and from color flow mapping. We will now discuss this approach to assessing the hemodynamic severity of mitral regurgitation. Various etiologies of mitral regurgitation will be illustrated throughout this discussion. For patients with mitral regurgitation, we still find that the 2D derived M mode from the mid left ventricle is useful for determining left ventricular dimensions for serial follow up. In this patient who has mitral valve prolapse, the M mode cursor has been directed across the left ventricle. This is the corresponding M mode. The left ventricular cavity is enlarged, measuring 64 millimeters in diastole and 36 millimeters in systole. It is also useful to measure the left atrium for serial follow-up. Here the cursor has been directed across the right ventricular outflow tract, aorta, and left atrium. The left atrium is mildly enlarged, measuring 45 millimeters. The diagnosis of mitral regurgitation can be confirmed by continuous wave Doppler. These signals were obtained with a non-imaging probe at the apex. The patient also has mild mitral stenosis. This holosystolic envelope represents mitral regurgitation. Note that this is a high velocity jet, 5.5 meters per second. Remember that the peak velocity does not correlate with the severity of regurgitation. There is always a large pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the left atrium during systole. Therefore, this high velocity is expected whether the regurgitation is mild or severe. In real time, listen to the characteristic audio signal of mitral regurgitation. There are clues from the CW examination that can be used to assess the severity of mitral regurgitation. This is the continuous wave examination from a patient with mitral valve prolapse. This is the mitral opening click, and this is the closing click. Note that the Doppler spectrum is not fully defined, and the strength of the signal is weak, and the gray levels are non-uniform within the envelope. These are clues that we are dealing with mild mitral regurgitation. This assessment is further supported by the diastolic mitral velocity which peaks at a normal level of one meter per second. Severe mitral regurgitation is usually accompanied by an increase in the forward velocity across the valve. This patient has a mitral heterograft prosthesis. Opening and closing clicks are again evident. Note that in contrast to the previous case, the mitral regurgitation signal is strong. Furthermore, the diastolic mitral velocity is increased to two meters per second, and the deceleration time appears normal. This combination of findings is indicative of severe mitral regurgitation. Pulsed wave Doppler can also be used to confirm mitral regurgitation, and in addition, it provides a means of estimating the severity of regurgitation. This patient has a dilated cardiomyopathy. All chambers are enlarged. 
In real time, you will note the reduction in left ventricular contractility. A Doppler cursor has been placed across the mitral valve with the sample volume just to the atrial side of mitral coaptation. The corresponding Doppler spectrum shows a systolic alias signal of mitral regurgitation. The degree of mitral regurgitation is proportional to the extent to which the Doppler regurgitant signals fill the left atrium. Therefore, we map the left atrium for regurgitation by placing the sample volume in multiple positions. Here the sample volume has been moved further into the left atrium, and the Doppler spectrum again shows mitral regurgitation. The sample volume has now been moved to the posterolateral wall of the atrium. The regurgitant signal is weaker, but still present. In addition to mapping the length of the regurgitant jet, we should also map its width. Here the sample volume has been moved medially, and regurgitation is again detected. In this case, the entire atrium was mapped, and mitral regurgitation was detected in all sampling positions, indicating that this patient has severe regurgitation. This is a parasternal long-axis freeze frame in systole. The posterior leaflet has prolapsed into the left atrium. This is a parasternal short-axis view from the same patient. The examiner, aware of the fact that the posterior leaflet is prolapsing and is likely to baffle its regurgitant jet anteriorly, has placed the sample volume anteriorly in the left atrium, just below the opened aortic valve. The corresponding Doppler display shows the typical alias signal from mitral regurgitation. The sample volume has been moved to the posterior left atrium. On the corresponding Doppler spectrum, we see continuous signals with the highest velocity in diastole. These are due to pulmonary venous flow. Had we not sampled in the region of the left atrium adjacent to the aorta, we would have completely missed the significant jet of mitral regurgitation. We will now move the sample volume back to its anterior position, and you will again appreciate the strong Doppler signals from the mitral regurgitation. From the foregoing discussion, it should be obvious that performance of complete and accurate pulsed wave mapping is extremely tedious. Color flow imaging provides a much more efficient means for semi-quantitating mitral regurgitation. We will now show examples of varying severities of mitral regurgitation as assessed by color flow imaging. This is a parasternal long axis view. The mitral leaflets appear mildly thickened. In this freeze frame, the mitral leaflets are closed. The color signals of mitral regurgitation are immediately apparent and occupy a very small portion of the left atrium. This is an example of mild mitral regurgitation. This is another patient with mild mitral regurgitation. This four-chamber view is being displayed with the apex down. This is the left ventricle, and this is the left atrium. These blue signals are due to the mild mitral regurgitation. These red signals in the atrium originate from the paraseptal pulmonary vein. Concentrate on the mitral regurgitation. This patient has severe reduction in left ventricular function, secondary to ischemic heart disease. This is an apical long axis view. Both the left ventricle and left atrium are enlarged, and the aortic valve is mildly calcified. <laughs> 
Patients with severe left ventricular dysfunction due to coronary disease often have significant mitral regurgitation. The left ventricular enlargement leads to distortion of the support apparatus in relation to the leaflets and also leads to annular dilatation. In addition, the papillary muscles may be infarcted. Note the jet of severe mitral regurgitation, which is color encoded as blue and fills the left atrium. In real time, you will also note a small diastolic jet in the left ventricular outflow tract. This represents mild aortic regurgitation. Focus your attention at this time on the severe degree of mitral regurgitation. For patients with mild or severe mitral regurgitation, the assessment of severity can usually be made by careful inspection of the colored jet in multiple planes. For borderline cases, particularly those in which we are trying to separate mild from moderate or moderate from severe, a more precise method is necessary. One such method has been proposed by Drs. Helmke and Nanda from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. In their analysis of 147 patients, by flow imaging and left ventriculography, they measured the regurgitant jet area and calculated the ratio of this area to the left atrial area. Since these regurgitant jets are three-dimensional, they calculated this ratio in three orthogonal planes. Excellent correlation with the angio grade of severity was obtained when the ratios of all three planes were averaged. The correlation was also excellent when all three planes were inspected and the single plane yielding the maximum ratio was utilized. The color flow regurgitant jet area to left atrial area ratios and the corresponding angiographic grades of severity are displayed here. This patient has papillary muscle dysfunction resulting in mitral regurgitation. This is a parasternal long axis view with the sector narrowed to focus on the mitral valve and left atrium. The mitral regurgitant jet is evident behind the closed mitral leaflets and a mental note is made of its spatial extent within the atrium for comparison to other planes. This is the parasternal short axis view. The regurgitant jet seen here beneath the anterior mitral leaflet, has a smaller area in this plane than in the long axis plane. Finally, we have moved to the apical four chamber plane. The regurgitant jet is most impressive in this plane, so we will use the regurgitant jet area to left atrial area ratio in this plane to determine severity. The jet has been traced and measures 5.83 centimeters squared. With color subtracted, the left atrium has been traced. Its area is 12.2 centimeters squared. Therefore, the regurgitant jet to left atrial area ratio in this plane is 5.83 divided by 12.2, or 48%. This correlates with severe regurgitation according to the previously displayed data. The jet area to left atrial area method is time consuming, and we want to emphasize that we use it in our laboratory only when the severity of regurgitation is not evident from simple visual inspection. Furthermore, there are certain situations in which tracing the regurgitant jet is problematic. This patient has mitral valve prolapse, and a flail segment of the posterior leaflet has been identified on this parasternal long axis view. With flow imaging activated, the mitral regurgitant jet fills the left atrium. The mosaic portion of the jet has been baffled toward the aorta, and the red portion is from blood that has swirled around the atrium. These jets that are baffled and that swirl within the left atrium are very difficult to trace and planimeter. We believe their severity is best assessed by the visual impression of the spatial extent of the jet.
In this same patient, we will now tilt the transducer to focus on the posterior portion of the left atrium. In this frame, a pulmonary vein is visible. And in this systolic frame, we see the pulmonary vein filling with color signals of mitral regurgitation. This systolic flow reversal in the pulmonary vein is another sign of severe mitral regurgitation. We will now set aside the discussion of assessing severity of mitral regurgitation in order to deal with one of the most important etiologies, mitral valve prolapse. Myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve with mitral valve prolapse is now the leading cause of mitral regurgitation in the United States. This is a parasternal long axis still frame in systole from a patient with mitral valve prolapse. This is the left ventricle. The aortic valve is opened. The left atrium is normal sized. To determine if the closed mitral leaflets have prolapsed, we see if they have broken the plane whose edge is created by drawing an imaginary line from the base of the anterior leaflet to the base of the posterior. In this case, the anterior and posterior leaflets move beyond this line into the left atrium. Therefore, prolapse is present. This is a parasternal long axis view from another patient with mitral prolapse. The M mode cursor crosses the mitral leaflets. This is the M mode that has been generated. Right ventricle, septum, anterior and posterior mitral leaflets, and left atrial posterior wall near its junction with the left ventricle. The leaflets are moderately thickened or redundant. In, In systole, Rather than moving forward until the next diastole, we see this posterior motion beginning in mid-systole. This is prolapse. This apical four-chamber view shows hammocking of the anterior mitral leaflet. One's first impression is that this leaflet is moving beyond the annulus into the left atrium. Dr. Levine, working in Dr. Wyman's laboratory at the Massachusetts General Hospital, has studied the shape of the mitral annulus at end systole and provided evidence that the annulus is saddle-shaped with the low points of the saddle located medially and laterally. These are the points that define the annulus in the four-chamber view. The annulus has its high points in the antero-posterior plane, which is the plane used in the parasternal long axis examination. The important point is that leaflet motion that appears to be beyond the annulus in the four-chamber view does not necessarily constitute prolapse into the left atrium, since the leaflets may only be moving beyond the lowest points of the saddle-shaped annulus. In order to diagnose prolapse in the four-chamber plane, the motion of the leaflet toward the left atrium must be segmental and severe, such as this prolapsing posterior leaflet. In these cases, the prolapse will usually also be detectable by careful scanning in the parasternal long axis format. It is very important from the viewpoint of the patient referred to the laboratory with a question of prolapse that the diagnosis be accurately confirmed or refuted. In this parasternal long axis view, the posterior mitral leaflet could only be faintly seen, but it appears to buckle into the left atrium. The continuous wave Doppler spectrum from this same patient shows a mitral regurgitant signal that is late systolic. In this apical four-chamber view from the same patient, the focus is on the left ventricle and left atrium.
Note the color signal for mild regurgitation behind the mitral leaflets. A cursor has been directed through this color jet. This is the resultant color M mode. There is red encoded flow through the mitral valve during early diastole and with atrial systole. During ventricular systole, the mitral leaflets have closed. Note the mosaic signals on the left atrial side of the leaflets in late systole. This is late systolic mitral regurgitation. This case illustrates how Doppler and flow imaging can assist in the diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse. This is a myxomatous posterior mitral leaflet. The distinctive pathologic feature is an increase in the middle valve layer, the spongiosa. This replaces part of the fibrosa, which weakens the valve, leading to leaflet expansion and chordal elongation. Leaflet expansion leads to redundancy of the valve. This specimen has been sectioned in short axis at valve level. Note the semilunar valves, plus the tricuspid and mitral. This is a myxomatous mitral valve. The leaflets are thickened, redundant, and elongated. This gives the valve a hemorrhoidal appearance in short axis. The motion pattern of mitral valve prolapse is extremely common. Only a small minority of these patients are at risk for serious clinical events. We have long felt that it is those patients with thickened, redundant leaflets that are at risk. This patient has mitral prolapse. In this short axis diastolic frame, the redundancy of the leaflets can be appreciated. Note that the leaflets appear thickened. The excess tissue also leads to folding of the leaflets as evidenced by the multiple surfaces. Doctors Rick Nishimura and Mike Magoon from the Mayo Clinic studied the relationship between valve redundancy and complications in 237 patients with mitral prolapse. In their study, the leaflet thickness was measured by M mode. Leaflets measuring greater than five millimeters in thickness were considered definitely abnormal. The 237 patients were followed for a mean of 6.2 years. As can be seen in this table, it was the patients with the redundant leaflets who suffered almost all the significant clinical complications during the follow-up period. In our day-to-day -day practice, we assess the mitral leaflet thickness from the two-dimensional exam rather than from M-mode. Myxomatous valves are usually evident by simple visual inspection but the leaflet thickness can also be measured to document abnormality. In this apical four-chamber view, the cursors will be used to measure the leaflets. The posterior leaflet measures seven millimeters in thickness. And the anterior leaflet is also seven millimeters thick. This patient not only had prolapse, but also a flail segment of the posterior leaflet. Rupture of the mitral cordy is one of the significant complications that can beset patients with myxomatous valves. Expansion of the spongiosa is responsible for the weakening of chordal attachments. This is a myxomatous mitral valve in short axis viewed from the left atrial side. This is a cord which is ruptured. This has resulted in hooding of this segment into the left atrium. Note that this hooding motion does not involve the entire leaflet, but rather is limited to one of the segments or scallops of the leaflet. This is an apical four-chamber systolic still frame. 
a pacemaker wire is partially visible in the right atrium. There is bowing of the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets. As previously discussed, this is not sufficient for a diagnosis of prolapse. The transducer has been tilted slightly, unmasking this flail segment of the posterior leaflet, which hoods into the left atrium in systole. Without careful scanning of the valve, this flail segment would have been completely missed. This is another systolic still frame in the apical four chamber format. The right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and left ventricle are all normal. The left atrium is enlarged. This small density in the left atrium behind the posterior mitral leaflet raises the question of vegetation. In real time, note that the anterior and posterior leaflets are both redundant and that the posterior prolapses in some cycles. Again, the valve was further investigated by slight tilting of the transducer. In this diastolic frame, note this cord, which is attached to the posterior mitral leaflet, but is not attached to the papillary muscle. In systole, note that the posterior leaflet does not coapt with the anterior leaflet. Rather, the tip of the posterior leaflet has moved beyond the tip of the anterior and into the left atrium. This is the criterion for judging this portion of the leaflet to be flail. The ruptured cord is visible behind the anterior leaflet. It is this combination of a thickened flail segment of the posterior leaflet and the ruptured cord that led to the original impression of vegetation. While we cannot always exclude infective endocarditis as a cause of the rupture, stop frame analysis will often allow us confidence that we are simply dealing with the ruptured structures rather than with vegetation. This is a pathology specimen sectioned in the parasternal long axis format. Right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, aortic valve, and aortic root. Note that the posterior mitral leaflet is flail it is hooded into the left atrium. We know that such flail leaflets frequently baffle the regurgitant jets in a characteristic manner. With posterior flail, the jet is typically baffled anteriorly, as per the arrow, toward the aortic root. Therefore, the murmur can be mistakenly diagnosed as being an aortic ejection murmur. Earlier in this tape, we demonstrated a case in which pulsed wave mapping was used to delineate anterior baffling of a mitral regurgitant jet. This baffling phenomenon is most easily appreciated by color flow imaging. This is a parasternal long axis frame. The mitral leaflets appear redundant. The posterior leaflet has moved beyond the anterior into the left atrium. This is a flail segment. On flow imaging, the turbulent mosaic portion of the mitral regurgitant jet is directed anteriorly in the left atrium toward the ascending aorta. The fact that these anteriorly directed signals represent mitral regurgitation can be confirmed by pulsed wave Doppler. Here a Doppler cursor has been positioned so as to cross the left atrium. The pulse sample volume is anterior in the turbulent portion of the jet. The cursor has generated a color M mode, right ventricular outflow tract and aorta, and left atrium. The color signal of mitral regurgitation is seen in systole, just below the M mode of the opened aortic cusps. The horizontal line indicates that the Doppler sample volume has been placed at this level in the regurgitant signal. <laughs>
The QRS can be used to identify systole. This is a typical aliased signal of mitral regurgitation. Now the pulse sample volume has been moved to the posterior left atrium. The line on the color M mode gives the same indication. The Doppler signal is that of pulmonary venous flow. In real time, the sample volume will again be moved anteriorly into the anteriorly directed regurgitant jet, and the typical Doppler signal of mitral regurgitation will reappear. This is a parasternal long axis still frame. The patient has prolapse of the anterior mitral leaflet and also has a small unsupported segment of the anterior leaflet. With color added, note that the flail segment of the anterior leaflet has baffled the regurgitant jet posteriorly along the posterior mitral leaflet. A continuous wave cursor has been directed through the mitral jet and a strong signal typical for mitral regurgitation results. On this tape, we have demonstrated the utility of echocardiography in delineating mitral pathology and assessing its functional significance. Structural abnormalities can be clearly defined by two-dimensional echo, while valuable hemodynamic information is added by Doppler and flow imaging exams. This same combination of structural and functional information is also invaluable in diagnosis of aortic valve disease, which is the subject we will discuss on tape number four.